stretching over hundreds of square miles along the Gulf of Mexico is the Louisiana Delta. As day breaks, the stillness is shattered by the sound of approaching combat. This great body of water is a bass angler's field of dreams and a fitting arena for one of the biggest tournaments in fishing, the Sitco Bassmasters Classic. Over the next three days, a field of 45 anglers will compete for a first prize of $100,000. With attendant endorsements, winning the Classic can net the champion the equivalent of a million dollars. All right, guys, everybody, one. The road to the Classic begins at hundreds of regional tournaments across the country, where the prizes may be much smaller. But the rules of engagement are the same. A flotilla of specially designed boats takes to the water. The signal is given. You're clear. And the battle is joined. You're clear. You're clear. Using an arsenal of technology, the players must figure out where the fish are, then get as many pounds of bass as possible into the boat before the closing horn. I came out here on Wednesday to pre-fish, and I was checking another fellow out there that was fishing with live bait, and I watched him catch three really nice fish and uh, I told my partner this morning you know I'd like to go there and let's see what happens we started catching these four and five pound fish and it turned out it was a great day each angler has his own game plan or strategy the fishing is pretty slow today so we've sized down we're using light line small worms and just dragging them very slowly well today we're Carolina rigging which is the weight on top with a bead, a long leader, and the worm down below it. And this will kick up some mud, and then that'll get the fish's attention, and then the, the worm will come back behind it. The contestants will cast with rods made of high-strength graphite. Their reels, made from space-age materials, are filled with monofilament line that is virtually invisible underwater. But ultimate success today will depend on what is attached to the end of the line. Victory will belong to the man or woman who can accurately match the fishing conditions to the proper offering from his or her treasure chest of amulets and charms. The time-honored and much revered tackle box. For example, this box here contains crankbaits. Another one you might see in a tackle box is a spinnerbait. All bass fishermen throw spinnerbaits. You'll have spinners, surface, crank, and most importantly, there's no tackle like the good old-fashioned worm box. In the worm box, they're going to have their own special worms that they always find to catch fish. Clearly, the thrill of competition isn't the only reason people love to fish. Today, there are over 30 million licensed anglers in the U.S. alone. So where does this fishing fever come from? Is it simply a pleasant escape from the pace and pressures of our modern lives? Or is there some deeper, more primordial connection? Back to a time when one's fishing skill was often the difference between survival and starvation. Most historians agree that fishing appeared somewhat later than its older cousin, hunting. The spear and the woven trap were probably the first tackle used. The woven trap was a thatched cage that allowed fish to swim in, but not out. The earliest known hooks, which date back to around 6,000 BC, were not hooked at all. They were called gorges. Gorges, a definite link to uh, the kind of earliest tackle available. It's just a uh, sharpened stone projectile at both ends with a groove in the center for a line. The limitations of the gorge always revolved around the fact that the fish actually has to swallow the bait, has to take it all the way down into the throat, hence the name gorge. 
most fish don't feed as rapaciously as that uh, implies. They will nibble at baits, they will bite at them, they'll pull at them to pull them away. And as a result, most gorge baits, I'm sure, were lost. I think the uh, really first hooks began in the Copper Age, if you will, roughly 5000 BC. The curve in these early hooks put the angle in angling. The angle is the hook. A lot of people think it's the rod and the reel, but the angle, the old word, literally means hook. Early line was fashioned by cutting thin strips of rawhide string from animal skins. Some Egyptian anglers even used the hair of their dead, which they braided together for greater strength. For a couple of odd millennia, ancient anglers stood at the water's edge, dangling their lines and baits in the water by hand. No doubt these hand lines could be painful when bringing in a large fish. Then, sometime around 2500 BC, somebody got the bright idea that by tying their line to the narrow end of a limb or sapling, they could extend their reach to deeper water, and perhaps bigger fish. One of the earliest depictions of rod and line fishing is this Egyptian painting, which dates back to around 2000 BC. Fighting a fish on a rod may have also introduced a new element into the mix. Fishing for fun, or sport. Why else would Egyptian nobles, who certainly weren't worried about their next meal, begin having private fishing ponds built in their palace gardens? This new sport wasn't exclusively a guy thing. There's a story involving Anthony and Cleopatra told by Plutarch that involved Cleopatra's love of angling and Anthony's incompetence in this area apparently. He though wanted to persuade her that he was uh, adept at anything that she was interested in and so he arranged for divers to dive down and attach fish to his line so he would catch as many if not more than she each time they went fishing. Cleopatra found out about this ruse of her lovers and she had one of her servants dive down with a fish that was already gutted, scaled, prepared, ready for the oven and attached that to his line. And he reeled this in with a great deal of panache and landed it on the deck and everybody broke up great roars of laughter and embarrassment and that was the end of his uh, fishing folly, shall we say. For centuries, men and women continued to fish with line tied to the tip of the rod. Horsehair had become the material of choice for most fishing line. The big drawback was, to make a line of any length, the hairs had to be knotted together. Around the 7th century BC, the Chinese came up with a better line, made from worms. Silkworms, that is. The advantage of using silk lines, they have a high tensile strength. Another advantage of the silk lines is they were probably one long strand. The quality of lines was vastly improved with the invention of looms and weaving machines. Better lines spawned more tackle innovation. By the 5th century, weights and plummets were cast from lead, and floats were carved from wood and cork. Double and treble hooks were being turned out by metal workers. These multi-point hooks increased an angler's chance of hooking a nibbling fish. By the 13th century, so much tackle was being invented that anglers needed some sort of container in which to carry it all. The first crude tackle pouches were made of leather or canvas. As more and more tackle began to appear, the pouches were replaced by woven creels that doubled as a tackle box and as a way to carry the angler's catch. In the late 15th century, the first major writing on fishing tackle appeared in England. It was the work of a dame. Dame Juliana Berners was a remarkable woman. She was active in field sports, certainly riding to hunt, falconry, things of this sort. What's interesting about Dame Juliana Berners, though, is that she did take the time to create this first treatise on field sports. For the first time in print, at least, we see fishing regarded as recreation in the West, and that's an important milestone. Berners wrote and drew extensively about fly tying, baits, line treatments, and hooks, but never mentioned the rod-mounted reel. In fact, reels have been in existence since at least the 12th century. 
the earliest depiction of a rod mounted winding reel is from a Chinese painting showing a man angling for turtles. In the mid 1600s, Sir Isaac Walton published what would become the most famous book on angling and tackle, The Complete Angler. Walton's writing was an encyclopedia of every kind of existing tackle, including the reel. These early winds or winches, as they were called, were made of wood, tin, and brass. They consisted of very simple hand cranked drums set in a cage or housing. By the 1800s, angling was beginning to catch on with the masses. But casting was still difficult because these same reels were susceptible to something called backlash. The spool tra travels faster than the speed of the line coming off of the reel, and it balls up in a bird's nest kind of mess that usually takes a considerable amount of time to untangle. One more level of innovation would be needed before angling could become as popular as other sports. Next, the real story of how Yankee ingenuity added the final piece to the modern angling rig and lured millions to the water's edge. The 20th century would see an explosion in the popularity of sport angling. But how had this narrowly practiced pastime become one of the fastest growing sports in America? In a word, technology. About the time that Henry Ford's Model T was revolutionizing travel, an inventor fisherman named William Shakespeare of Kalamazoo, Michigan was doing the same thing for angling. Shakespeare patented an improved version of an earlier invention, the level winding bait casting reel. This is the Shakespeare level wind reel that is more or less the standard configuration of level winds. What a level wind does is when you retrieve the line, it evenly spools it or puts it on the reel evenly, where in the past you would have to do it with your thumb and, and index finger. These new reels allowed the occasional weekend angler to cast and retrieve with a minimum of practice. Bait casting boomed. Naturally, the growing number of bait casters increased the demand for something to cast. Bait. Bait is a fishing staple that has its own strange history. The Egyptians did use uh, live rats in uh, their angling techniques. The Nile perch can reach over 200 pounds, so I guess they were trying to get some pretty big fish at that time using these live rats. Some Greek anglers apparently tried wine to attract fish by scent. If this seems odd, consider this more contemporary scent bait tale. We caught blue marlin on WD-40 bait. WD-40 on a bait started probably in the 60s when WD-40 first came out. And the guys in the taco store would say, I've got a new secret, you can't tell anybody about it. And they were spraying it on artificial lures for blue marlin fishing. Odder still are bait stories involving fast food and footwear. All these fishermen spent hours and bought all kinds of tackle trying to catch these big record-sized trout on Lake Tanicomo. Kid goes out, puts some McDonald's french fries on the end of his hook, and he sets the all-time lake record for, for rainbow trout. That had guys shook up. I don't know how many of them were sneaking around with french fries after that. Probably one of the craziest things I ever do were in St. Thomas. The blue marlin are biting pretty good. So we took a hook and rigged a flip-flop. Next blue marlin came up and crashed it. And we caught a 400-pound blue marlin on a flip-flop. Most fish, however, tend to have less exotic, more predictable tastes. In the early 20s, the classic baits were seen as a cash crop. Enterprising folks from all over the country began raising and selling minnows, crayfish, crickets, frogs, and of course, worms. At the Happy D Ranch in Visalia, California, bait wranglers Carolyn Fox and Dorothy Benoit harvest and raise thousands of red wigglers. The machine is a worm harvester or separator. If we were to process all day long, we could probably process 200 to 250 pounds of worms in an eight-hour day. The red worms or red wigglers are terrific for fishing bait. 
They move more than night crawlers do on a hook. They are smaller than night crawlers, so some folks may want two worms on a hook at a time, but they do make great fish bait. But what about the angler who wants to raise his own worms? This is the famous can of worms. This is the most famous and used worm bin in the world. Fishermen love this because they can grow their own worms in here. So they don't have to pay $2.50 per 20 or dozen. They can grow them by the thousands in this bin. As bait fishing increased in popularity, it began to focus attention on the efficiency of hooks. In 1928, a young fly tire named Drew McGill began to study the mechanics of eagle talons and how their overcurved shape made them so effective in hooking their prey. McGill began tinkering with the hooks of the day, bending and twisting them out of shape with his fishing pliers. He discovered that by offsetting the angle of the eye and aligning it with a point, a geometrically perfect line of force was created. McGill's new design revolutionized hook design around the world. Today, Wright and McGill's Eagle Claw Fishing Tackle Company is one of the largest in the world and the only remaining hook maker in America. As tackle technology continued to improve, the American tackle box began to be invaded by a new kind of tackle. Artificials. Man-made baits. Anglers have been using lures since ancient times, but the new dependable reels brought them into the, well, mainstream. One of the first and most basic lures of the modern era was the spinner, or spoon. Legend has it that its development was the result of a fortunate accident. J.T. Buell was having lunch in a boat, dropped a spoon over the side of the boat, and as the spoon fluttered down, a fish rose and hit the spoon. He got the idea, gee, if I cut the handle off the spoon, attach a hook to it, attach a line to a hook, and he was the first patented lure in the United States. Lure maker Lou Eppinger took the spoon lure to the next level with the creation of his red and white daredevil spoon. The daredevil spoon was a very, very popular spoon in the, in the whole Northeast for catching all types of fish. Spoons were predominantly sight lures. Their underwater spinning motion simulated the flashing run of a fleeing bait fish. In 1902, James Hedden of Dowagiac, Michigan, created one of the first surface bass plugs. Hedden called it a Dowagiac underwater or Dowagiac minnow. Several of the surface lures were designed that on retrieve you would jerk the tip of the rod, causing the lure to splash water forward. As a predator fish, they were attracted and would, would hit any of those surface lures. Fred Arbogast achieved lure-making immortality with the creation of his famous jitterbug. The jitterbug is still being made today, and the first bass I ever caught, I caught on a jitterbug. In the 1950s, the rubber or plastic worm bounced onto the scene and has remained a staple of freshwater fishing ever since. In 1960, tackle dealers began importing a strange-looking lure from a firm in Finland called the Rapala Company. These sleek surface minnow plugs were hand carved from balsa wood by the company's founder, Larry Rapala. What made the plug so deadly was an innovation called a diving lip, a plastic vein fixed in the lure's face, which caused the plug to dive when the angler retrieved it. The faster the retrieve, the deeper the dive. The fish ate it up. The lip lures to me is one of the most important innovations in fishing. And I believe Rapala was one of the very, very first who came out with a plastic lip. A lip plug today is probably 60% of the total market of fishing lures. To date, more freshwater records have been set and broken on lip lures than with any other design. But will they remain the kings forever? Some anglers believe that one of the next big things is something called the boomerang. The boomerang isn't a lure at all. It's a rig that uses super strong bungee cord material to impart an extremely lifelike action to any lure or bait. 
What this is, is the world's first remote control device for fishing lures. It allows the fisherman to fish in one location and his bait never stops moving. The bait actually follows the action of the rod tip. So he can fish for hours under a docks, piers, holes, and fishes beds. You don't have to cast and reel, cast and reel, cast and reel. You allow the fish to come to the lure instead of you trying to throw to the fish. Back around 1940, as artificials gained popularity, a strange looking device began to appear on American streams. It was called the spinning or spin casting reel. Unlike the bait casting reel, the spinning reel's line spool didn't revolve. Instead, a spinning pickup bale rotated around the reciprocating spool and distributed line neatly and evenly. Backlash and bird's nests, those nightmares of anglers everywhere, became virtually impossible. Spinning reels revolutionized fishing from the standpoint that it made it easier for the common guy just to pick up a rod and reel and fish with. Almost at the same time that the spinning reel was introduced, another scientific breakthrough changed the world of angling forever. That breakthrough was nylon monofilament line. The monofilament line did not come apart like the Dacron or the Lenium lines. And this is why we had to have this type of line for this type of fishing reel. While the new lines, lures, and reels got all the press, the unsung hero of modern angling remained the steel or aluminum box that had to carry all this stuff. But was anybody trying to make a better, lighter box? In 1952, Pete Henning, founder of the Plano Molding Company, returned from a fishing trip with a sore arm and an idea. Why not design and produce a line of plastic tackle boxes? The rest, as they say, is history. Today's lightweight tackle boxes are as sexy and high-tech as all the cool stuff inside them. And Plano is the largest maker of tackle boxes in the world. As the development of freshwater tackle was playing out on streams and lakes, similar innovations were making a splash in salt water, where the catch was often larger than the angler. Next, the tackle box takes on the big game of the deep. Today's big game deep sea angling is like freshwater fishing on steroids. On the stream or lake, the emphasis is on the bite. Out here, things are different. The catch often outweighs the catcher. The bite is only the beginning of a fight to the finish that may last hours. The sheer scale of the sea adds a sense of mystery and danger. There's something about the sea, being on the sea itself, the fact that it's unexpected. You go into the ocean, you have absolutely no idea what surprises there may be, and there always are some surprises. Where freshwater angling began in Europe, saltwater sport fishing got its start in the New World. With the arrival of its first true champion, the year was 1831. Sport fishing in America really begins with a man named Henry William Herbert. Herbert was an English outdoor writer with a shady past. He had been disowned by his family and sent to the New World. The fishing abundance of the New York coast amazed and inspired him. But he arrived at a time when ocean fishing was the domain of the commercial fleets. Large haul nets and multi-hook hand lines were being used to drag in fish by the ton. Herbert, writing under the alias Frank Forrester, was the first major voice to argue that ocean fish could and should be fished for sport using a single hook on a rod and reel. By the end of the Civil War, Herbert's ideas had a small but fanatical following. This new breed cut their teeth on striped bass and bluefish, then looked around for a real saltwater challenge. Their search took them to the coast and inland waterways of Florida. The tarpon was really the first quarry of uh, saltwater sports fishermen back in the 1800s. Uh, they traveled specifically to Florida to catch the tarpon. A tarpon would run anywhere from 40 to 200 pounds. A spectacular jumper and a, an extra hard fighter, just a wonderful game fish. Herbert's disciples got a rude awakening when they started hooking tarpon on tackle they had used for stripers and salmon tackle of the day they used to catch the tarpon was highly inadequate. 
The tarpon was a much stronger fish and would fight a lot harder and could uh, actually drag the angler around the water for hours while he tried to land the fish. The direct drive breakless reels of that period were no match for tarpon or any other big game fish. So they invented kind of a leather thumb drag where they would press their thumb against this leather which would then press against the line to retard the line paying off the reel. Reel makers experimented with various braking systems that could slow the run of large game fish. The first major breakthrough was something called the star drag system, which is still in use today. The star drag system was really the first drag system developed that made it easy for the angler to adjust the drag on the reel, to adjust the tension and the amount of line that was going out while he was playing the fish. The star drag was a threaded mechanical brake that the angler controlled with his thumb. Tightening the star wheel put pressure against the reel spool and put the brakes on a running fish. By the late 1800s, saltwater rods and reels had improved to the point where they could handle the largest tarpon. Then, something happened in California that raised the bar to new heights. The year was 1898. Dr. Charles Frederick Holder uh, in Pasadena, California, took a trip out to Avalon and he was watching people uh, fish with uh, hand lines and uh, ropes and giant hooks and in an unsportsmanlike way for tuna and he thought he'd give a try at fishing with rod and reel and he was credited with catching the first bluefin tuna on rod and reel in 1898 in Avalon, California. Big game sport fishing was a hit but early anglers still had some painful lessons to learn about their tackle. Some early direct drive reels of the day had earned themselves the inglorious nickname of knuckle busters. One of the big problems was when the line was paying out, when the fish was running the line off, the handle on the reel would spin backwards. Now an angler would try and put his hand in there and grab the handle to slow the fish down to stop the fish and oftentimes knuckles were broken, fingers were broken, and fishmen were injured. In the late 1800s, deep sea reel makers like Kavalowski in California and the Vom Hofs in New York began designing reels that would allow the spool to turn independently of the handle while the fish was running. By the early 20th century, the sport that Henry William Herbert had started was becoming the pastime of the rich and famous. One major contributor to the sport's popularity was also a writer. One of the most remarkable men involved in the early history of, of saltwater angling was Zane Gray. He was a very popular writer. At one point, uh, his book sold better than uh, any other writer except the McGuffey Readers and perhaps the Holy Bible. He uh, was one of the founders of Paramount Studios. And he was a great publicist on behalf of angling. Another writer of the day who loved ocean fishing was a fellow named Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway was using the same tackle that everybody else was using at the time. What made him successful where everybody else failed was his uh, technique. Hemingway was very aggressive and he said that if you battled the fish, if you beat the fish, then the fish wouldn't beat you. And he was the first person to be successful in uh, 1935 landing a giant bluefin tuna in Bimini. Along with a love of big game angling, Gray and Hemingway shared a deep hatred of sharks that would tear a big fish to shreds during the fight. Hemingway, his response was to simply tackle the shark problem head on as he saw it. He carried a machine gun aboard his boat and every opportunity he could uh, take he would uh, pour lead into these fish. The shark factor increased the need to tire and boat fish more quickly. This started a new demand for stronger rods. Up until this point, most of the rods that were being used were made of hickory and green heart. In the 1940s, a material was developed that would make lightweight tubular rods that were stronger than solid wood or tubular steel. That material was fiberglass. By the 1950s, big game anglers using improved drag reels and fiberglass rods were consistently catching marlin, tuna, and swordfish. Today, fiberglass rods remain extremely popular. 
at the Rodco Manufacturing Company in Santa Ana, California. Fiberglass impregnated material is rolled out into sheets and then cut into precise patterns. Through a series of exacting steps, this flimsy material will be rolled, baked, painted, appointed, and packaged. The rods are then shipped off to the local tackle shop and eventually out to sea and into action. Next, we'll hang up our deep sea broomsticks and take down the magic wand of the five fishermen as the tackle box becomes the tackle vest. The physics involved in what we call fly angling or fly casting is unlike any other form of casting. In fly fishing, you cast the weight of the line. In all other kinds of fishing involving casting something, you're casting the weight of the lure or the bait. Fly fishing goes back a long way in human history. Egyptian paintings showed uh, six lines dangling from a pole and each of those lines had an artificial fly attached to it. So probably the Egyptians were the first fly anglers. Modern fly fishing began in England in 1496. Once again, it was Dame Juliana Berners. Dame Juliana Berners was probably the first amateur aquatic entomologist. By studying insects, uh, she realized that certain fish, particularly trout, feed upon them, and she started to develop flies that imitated these insects. At the core of fly casting lives the question, how can I cast a lure that is lighter than air across a stream? The answer? Fly line is much thicker and heavier than monofilament. Line used for wet flies is designed to sink. Line used with dry flies has a special coating that allows it to float. The fact that the weight is in the line, not in the lure, made fly tackle different from the ground, or should we say, from the rod up. Finding the best rod material that could cast this special line, however, didn't happen overnight. Starting in the 15th century, they start experimenting with uh, different woods, hickory, willow, uh, lemon woods, and later on they use green heart. The weight of the solid woods tired the arm in a matter of hours and sent rod makers on a search for material that was limber, light, and strong. In the early part of the 19th century, they experimented with strips of bamboo that were glued together. In 1867, Hiram Leonard developed a six-sectional rod, which became the standard and is still employed today in, in modern bamboo manufacturing. In spite of all bamboo's virtues, it did have an important downside. Bamboo manufacturing is labor-intensive. You have to cure it, strip it, and put it together. This is a labor-intensive time frame of months to get it to where it can be usable uh, to fish with. The extensive labor involved in producing split cane rods began to price them out of the mainstream market. Bamboo rods today are very expensive and they're very exquisite instruments. These rods can cost between $2,000 and $3,000 and they'll take anywhere from a year to four years to get one. In the 1940s, fiberglass was introduced as an alternative to bamboo. Glass rods, as they're called, are still very popular today. The next generation of fly rods came from the heavens. Aerospace has impacted our sport of fishing. The rods that we use, these are made out of graphite materials which have come out of the aerospace industry. They're light, they're module, they have a tremendous amount of strength and flexibility. At the St. Croix Rod Building Plant in Park Falls, Wisconsin, the average rod moves through approximately 36 pairs of human hands from first step to last. Rods that are nine feet in length can weigh as little as three ounces, 
and still land a six to ten pound trout in a fast moving stream. Fly casting not only changed tackle, it changed technique. By virtue of its backward and forward casting motion, it forced the angler off the bank and out into the water. Waders became a staple of the serious fly fisherman. It changed the tackle box from a large container that you plunk down on the bank to a piece of apparel. The tackle box of a fly fisherman put your fly boxes in, leaders, uh, tippet material, uh, tools that you would be using, such as clippers. With all this high-tech gear, such as ultralight rods and floating lines, it's no wonder that fly fishermen sometimes see themselves as a special breed. The fisherman's spot in Van Nuys, California is a mecca for West Coast fly fishermen. These guys are serious. At the center of this temple of trout sits the spiritual master, the fly tire. The challenge of any fly tire is, you know, to take these materials and make it have a silhouette or shadow, some type of light pattern to match what the fish would naturally be feeding on. The fly tire uses some strange sounding techniques in his craft. Applying the yarn to the hook to create the body of the fly is called dubbing. Palmering is a method of winding thread to make the hackles simulate wings. As the master works, an insect begins to take shape. Then what you're going to do is finish the fly with what we call the whip finisher. And that just is a tool that uses to finish the fly, helps lock the thread down and prevent the fly from coming apart. And then you're going to add just a slight bit of head cement to hold the thread in place so the fly doesn't come apart on you. And then you got your fly. Okay, we'll toss in some flies along with our plugs, crankbaits, and crawdads, spinners, spoons, and a couple of pounds of worms. Hmm, the American tackle box is getting pretty crowded. So next, we'll see how today's anglers and tackle makers are thinking outside the box. After centuries of angling invention, the tackle box has undergone some radical changes in shape, size, and content. My first box was a little bitty metal tackle box that you could almost uh, put in a big pocket. You look at tackle boxes today, a circus dog couldn't jump over them. In the old days, you'd load your tackle box into your boat. Today, your tackle box is the boat. Today's floating tackle box is powered by a foot-controlled motor that inches it along silently leaving the angler's hands free to cast. While GPS satellites track the boat's position and warn of changing weather, the angler tracks the fish with an incredible host of electronic helpers. The depth finders today, they're so advanced. They not only tell you the depth of water that you're in, they'll help you pinpoint ideal structural features. As each year brings a new boatload of cool, high-tech toys, a question arises. Can a fisherman have enough, have enough tackle? Oh, you, you never have enough tackle. You always need, uh, need gear. You will never have enough tackle. Not, there's always another rod, another reel. Probably have about a half a million dollars worth of tackle. I have probably 500 rods and 500 reels and 10,000 lures and 10,000 or a million hooks and sinkers. Still, some anglers are able to resist the high-tech blitz and maintain a more laid-back approach. Relaxing. You come out here on a Saturday or a Sunday morning, and I, I do it probably just about every week. The only thing that happens to me sometimes when I get a fish, I, I really don't know where I'm going to land for, you know. Similar like right now, I'm, I'm talking to you guys, and I don't know where in the heck I am. <laughs> Today, anglers spend approximately $2 billion a year on fishing tackle. At outdoor superstores like Bass Pro Shops, Cabela's, and Galleons, 
You can buy anything imaginable for your tackle box in person, by catalog, or online. You can attend clinics and take lessons. With all this money and tackle changing hands, one might pause to wonder if tackle is a good investment. Sure, but you might have to wait a few years. Over the last few decades, antique fishing tackle has become very popular with collectors. I'm fortunate enough to have Clark Gable's tackle box, which is leather outside and herringbone lined on the inside. So quite an elaborate change from what initially were tin tackle boxes. Tackle boxes got very elaborate as fishing continued to become popular and expand. Several years ago, the service repairman had acquired a tackle box in partial exchange for his repair bill. He sent me pictures of what's inside the tackle box. And my knees honestly went weak when I looked at those pictures. They were lures I'd wanted for my collection forever. And my partner and I subsequently paid him $7,500 for that tackle box that he gave a $100 credit to the owner of. I have paid in excess of $10,000 for one fishing lure. Collectors aren't the only ones interested in antique tackle. A lot of it finds its way to the International Game Fishing Association Museum in Dania Beach, Florida. But antique tackle isn't all that's happening at the IGFA. Dania Beach is to fishing what Cooperstown is to baseball. Here you can check the official statistics of every world record game fish ever caught. Looking back at the last hundred years of tackle technology might cause us to wonder, is there any sport left in sport fishing? Do the fish still have a chance? It's amazing how a fish with a brain size of a pea can still outsmart you. You were there yesterday, you caught them like mad, you go back to the same spot and they're gone. And you can't figure out why. But that's one of the things that makes fishing great is the challenge and the uncertainty. The challenge and the uncertainty continue to bring us back to the water's edge to try our luck and test our skill at this ancient sport. And as long as we continue, our fortunes will depend on that trusted and revered sanctuary of strange and smelly stuff, the tackle box.